Uh, good morning, and th welcome to all of you. Um, I'd like to just provide a few introductory comments related to the seminar, Persistent Immune Effects of Wildfire PM Exposure During Childhood Development. Uh, infants and children are widely believed to be particularly vulnerable to air pollution exposure, and this is primarily related to the rapid lung development and immune system development that occurs during that life stage. And those of you who live in California or the Western US are quite aware of the common nature of wildfires in this area and that the wildfires are typically associated with very high levels of PM 2.5. But there are very few studies on the health effects of wildfire smoke and there are none on infants or young children. Uh, this study came about through an unexpected confluence of several factors. First in 2008, a, s a very large series of wildfires impacted the Sacramento Valley. And there were very high levels of PM 2.5 for 10 days out of a two week period. On these 10 days, the levels were considerably higher than the 24 hour standard for PM 2.5. And the California National Primate Center happens to be located at UC Davis in the middle of the Sacramento Valley. And it houses a large colony of primates that live outdoors. And the fires happened to occur at the end of the spring birthing season. And so there were a large number of exposed infant animals. Uh, this confluence of factors gave the opportunity to assess effects of high level wildfire PM 2.5 exposure during infancy. Uh, the results of this study add several important things to our understanding of air pollution health effects. Uh, this is the first study that has looked at wildfire PM 2.5 and immune system development and also assessed linkages between immune and lung development. And it addresses the vulnerability of infants and whether effects of exposure during infancy persist at maturity. And with that, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lisa Miller. Uh, she received a PhD in comparative pathology from UC Davis and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University. She joined the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine Department of Anatomy, Physiology, and Cell Biology as an assistant research cell biologist in 1997 and was appointed assistant professor in 2008. Uh, her research program focuses on pulmonary immunology, and she teaches a graduate course in immunology and anatomy for first-year veterinary students. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Miller. Thank you very much, Dr. Drexler, for the introduction. Um, let's see if I can get myself. So I have a, uh, pardon me? The, oh, the, yes, the, this is on. Can, can folks in the back hear me OK? All right. I'll try to avoid turning. This is sort of my teaching mode of turning and, and talking to my slides. So I'll hopefully try to stay focused on the, the monitor here. Um, so thank you again for inviting me to present the findings from our uh, Air Resources Board funded uh, study. And um, I'd like to start off by uh, giving you an overview of what I'm going to be presenting today. Um, first of all, I'm going to give you uh, an introduction to the California National Primate Center program a very brief introduction, and this is primarily so all of you get a sense of how our animals are housed, um, particularly the, the animals that are housed outdoors, which is what we've, uh, we've studied um, for this project. Um, next, I'm going to be talking about or giving you some background on um, how non-human primates um, actually serve as an excellent model 
um, for understanding um, uh, early childhood development and the pathogenesis of actually multiple diseases. Um, next, I'm going to give you uh, or provide you with the scientific basis for the studies that we actually proposed um, in this particular project. And then lastly, I'll end up with um, a presentation of the key findings from the study. Um, specifically, as Dr. Drexler mentioned, we studied um, the immune response to these exposures in our animals, as well as parameters of lung function. So uh, briefly, um, the Primate Center, or the, or the California National Primate Center, is actually one of eight national primate centers in the country. Let's see if I can get this to, oh, here we go. There we go, okay, here we are. Um, and as you can see, the, uh, the primate center system, the National Primate Center system is distributed throughout the, the, the country. Um, we are one of the largest um, with regards to the numbers of animals, um, particularly, particularly those that are housed outdoors. Um, some, brief, some statistics are presented on the slide. Uh, for the Primate Center. Um, we are located approximately two miles off campus, off the UC Davis campus. Um, this is not because they don't like us, it's because we require a significant amount of space um, to house all of our animals. We have a very large footprint out there, um, at least 85 acres, as well as um, a significant amount of acreage as a buffer zone. Um, the, the numbers of animals that we have out there require a small army of staff to care and maintain our animals. And we actually have our own team of on-site veterinarians 24-7. Um, um, in addition to uh, our animal care staff, we have an on-site hospital as well as a clinical laboratory. and. I th a very sophisticated uh, electronic medical record system that tracks all of our animals. Um, this map gives you a visual of how our animals are housed outdoors. Um, over here, let's see, uh, over here is uh, an area that we call our north colony. So all of the rectangles that you see here uh, represent uh, individual half acre cages, um, or what we call them field cages, which house um, approximately 200 animals um, in each one of these cages. Um, let's see if I can get this, sorry. Here we go. Um, and each one of these field cages, and there's a picture of this here, I don't know if you can appreciate it, um, uh, houses multiple family subunits, or, or, or family units, excuse me. And so each one of these units, uh, or family units, um, interacts with uh, the other family members in each cage. And um, the, each uh, cage is monitored on a regular basis, on a daily basis, uh, for stability. So animals aren't just moved from one cage to another. They, uh, each cage is, is uh, maintained in a very stable fashion. This is important for um, the overall health of our animals. And um, I also uh, wanted to uh, bring up uh, the uh, the housing environment um, and the location of all of these field cages because um, when we studied our animals, we actually attempted to select from multiple field cages so that we could get a genetically diverse population um, in our survey. Uh, the primary uh, species that we house at the California Primate Center is the rhesus macaque monkey, which is shown here. Um, here and here, and you can see um, our outdoor animals, um, uh, like uh, uh, children, um, play extensively. We have uh, a number of uh, 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 playground equipment um, that are utilized in all of our outdoor field cages. Um, we also have a small colony of TD monkeys, which is a New World monkey, um, and these animals are used for behavioral studies. So next, I'm going to uh, talk about or, or give you some uh, background on the rationale for why non-human primates serve as an excellent model of childhood development. 
So uh, what this slide illustrates is the overall anatomy of the rhesus monkey lung here. And um, in comparison, we have uh, the, the, uh, the lung of a rat and the lung of a mouse. Now, one of the distinctive anatomical features of rodent lung as compared with um, primate lung, so primate, non-human primates as well as humans, is that the, uh, develop the uh, rodent lung develops in a monopodial fashion. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, what that means is that branches that form from the, or that, that contribute to the, the lung actually come off of a main axis. So um, a good visual illustration of this would be um, a conifer or a pine tree. Um, all of those branches come off of a main trunk. Now in contrast, the uh, primate lung actually develops in um, what we refer to as a dichotomous fashion. So all of the branches, all of the smaller branches, d uh, come or divide off of larger branches. So it's a different growth pattern, very different growth pattern for primates versus rodents. Another r distinctive feature of primate lung development as compared with rodent lung development is this very extensive period of growth that takes place after birth, as you can see here. So after birth in a primate lung, we have a very extensive period of alveolarization. So what does that mean? That means alveoli are continuously added to the lung. And this alveolarization period can actually continue through adolescence. And studies that have been done by investigators at the California Primate Research Center have actually documented um, very, uh, in a very specific fashion that uh, rhesus macaque lungs actually develop in a similar fashion. So alveoli are continuously added to the rhesus macaque lung um, through adolescence into early adulthood. Now in contrast, with, uh, rodent lungs actually uh, complete lung development, complete alve alveolarization um, uh, at two months of age. So uh, they complete it, uh, they're, they're the period of development, lung development, is very much compressed as compared with uh, primate lungs. So why is that such a, a big deal? Why is that important? Well, as, as you can envision, if alveolarization, lung development, continues on a, uh, on a project uh, uh, in an, uh, over a long period of time, um, that leaves the individual uh, more susceptible to environmental challenges. So um, just briefly, this uh, slide uh, uh, gives you a visual of the anatomical uh, changes that take place in the rhesus monkey lung, um, starting at w one month of age all the way through adulthood. So you can see the extensive development that takes place throughout life. Now, in addition to uh, 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 developmental changes in lung structure, um, this early childhood period of growth um, is also a period of time in which the immune system um, uh, grows and develops. And this is very important, in, again, in understanding how uh, the pathogenesis of childhood diseases um, takes place. Um, this is a very uh, susceptible period of time in which a number of different changes are taking place in the immune system. So what this uh, a cartoon or graph illustrates is the variation, oops, excuse me, the variation in um, a number of different pathways associated with the innate uh, immune system as compared with, uh, uh, let's see, excuse me, I'm trying to, I'm not a PC person, so, <laughs> um, so, you, ooh, sorry. Um, so you can see the variation in uh, a number of different pathways associated with innate immunity. So the take-home message here is that 
immune system development doesn't take place in a linear fashion. This, we have uh, various pathways that go up and down throughout life. And this is important, again, when you're studying uh, a laboratory animal model and you're trying to determine whether or not the effects that you see are comparable to the human population, you need to study a model in which you, you uh, have fluctuations in development, both in lung structure and function as well as in the immune system. So um, my research program has spent the last 10 years really focusing on this interaction between lung development and immune system development. And what we've been focusing on is trying to understand how within this very sensitive window um, within the first year of life, how environment can contribute and modulate the normal development of both the lung and the immune system and ultimately how this can contribute to the development of persistent lung disease in kids. So in summary, what we understand about the, uh, the rhesus macaque in lung development and immune system development is that it's very, very similar. The patterns of development of, are very, very similar for both the pulmonary system as well as the immune system. So this is why we have utilized this animal model to study um, the pathogenesis of childhood lung disease. So next I want to uh, uh, spend a few minutes talking about the scientific basis for the studies that were proposed in this project. So the, uh, the, the basis, the, 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 the scientific basis for the, uh, the methodologies and the analysis that were conducted in this uh, Air Resources Board study actually uh, originated from a series of studies that were funded and supported by the, uh, the NIH, specifically NIEHS. And what this uh, uh, funding mechanism um, uh, focused on is understanding how early life ozone exposures contribute to persistent um, changes in lung function as well as changes in immunity. So here uh, in this uh, cartoon, attempt to move things around here, um, what we studied is specifically in an experimental model, we studied the effects of ozone exposure um, within the lung and we, in, in order to ascertain whether the immune system was affected by these exposures, these early life exposures, we challenged the, this, uh, the, um, our animals with endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide, um, which is a molecule that is on the outer cell wall of gram-negative bacteria and actually serves as a mimic for um, uh, an infectious organism. And binding of lipopolysaccharide to a receptor, which is located on airway epithelium as well as uh, cells within the immune system, elicits an inflammatory response. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, 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 of a, of a lesson in, oops, excuse me, uh, a lesson in uh, innate immunity. Um, so here in this cartoon uh, um, is illustrated a number of different uh, pathways that are associated with innate immune signaling. The pathway that we're focused on here is this pathway this arrow here, um, where components of the bacterial cell bind to a receptor, a, actually a family of receptors. Um, these receptors bind to molecules that are common to a variety of different pathogens. Um, these molecules are called PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And the receptors that we're really focused on are the family of toll-like receptors, or TLR. And in the case of lipopolysaccharide, the receptor, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is toll-like receptor 4. So uh, what this slide shows you is um, a, an exposure protocol. 
and I'm going to make an attempt to move this uh, arrow around here. Um, for the uh, study that I mentioned to you, um, this, uh, in, this, in this study which we published in 2011, um, it, again, this is an experimental exposure. Um, we exposed infant monkeys from starting at birth through six months of age. And we exposed them to 0.5 parts per million ozone for eight hours per day in, in an episodic fashion. Um, so again, this took place within the first six months of life. And then what we did, which was very um, unusual, um, is that we didn't evaluate them uh, at this time point, at the completion of the exposure. We actually allowed these animals to mature until, until they were 12 months of age or one year of age. And then we evaluated the animals in, with regards to lung function and uh, responsiveness to um, uh, endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide. And what we found, which is summar summarized here uh, on this slide, yeah, okay, um, is that when our one-year-old animals, again, remember the animals uh, had received ozone and uh, were allowed to mature under filtered air conditions until one year of age. Um, in our control animals, when, when we challenged them with uh, lipopolysaccharide, we see where we saw a, a significant increase in cells within the lung in response to this challenge. And many of those cells were neutrophils, which is what we would expect uh, uh, w with an endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide challenge. This is very similar to what's been shown in human studies. Um, in contrast, in the animals that were previously exposed to ozone, um, we saw a very dramatic and significant attenuation of, uh, of total numbers of cells within the lung, um, both at a very early time point as well as a later time point. So there was no catch up here. Um, and then we also saw an attenuation of neutrophilic um, or, or influx of neutrophils. So bottom line, animals that had ex been exposed to ozone very early in life um, were persistently changed um, with regards to their ability, the ability of the lung to respond to an innate challenge. So again, lipopolysaccharide is essentially a mimic or a surrogate for an infectious um, agent. If we had given these animals a real infectious agent, um, like a bacteria, they would have responded in a similar fashion. So we see a, a, diminu a diminution in the ability of the animals to respond to an infectious agent. Um, so that, so I just showed you data for what took place in the lung. Within the peripheral blood, um, we saw a similar type of effect in that with uh, uh, LPS, lipopolysaccharide challenge, you see a dramatic influx in uh, or increase in numbers of white blood cells in the periphery as well as an increase in neutrophils. Animals that were treated with ozone, as you can see, have a, a, a rather variable response both within the total white blood cell count as well as the neutrophil count. So uh, basically these animals um, responded very, very poorly, both within the lung as well as within um, the, their peripheral blood. Now, the next question we had upon receiving these results and seeing these results, which were unexpected, um, the next question that I had is whether or not the effects of ozone were limited to a response in the lung. In other words, if we take the peripheral blood cells out from these animals and challenge them in vitro, in culture, um, can we recapitulate these effects? And the answer is yes. So um, it, uh, what this slide shows is a, the outcome of uh, two types of cultures or two types of assays. Um, the top slide shows the generation of a protein called IL-6, which is a cytokine. It's elicited in an inflammatory response. Um, in response, these are uh, peripheral blood 
oops, oops, sorry. Um, uh, these are uh, cultures of peripheral blood that have been challenged or by the addition of lipopolysaccharide. Again, this is all in vitro. Um, as you can see here very clearly, blood samples from control animals elicit an, were elicited an effect in, in response to lipopolysaccharide, um, whereas animals that had received ozone um, had a very poor response to the challenge. And we get a similar type of effect with when we evaluated the synthesis of interleukin-8, which again is a cytokine that's typically produced in an inflammatory response. So bottom line, both in vivo, in the whole animal, as well as within um, a culture vessel in vitro, um, we were able to demonstrate that previous exposure to ozone um, resulted in a persistent or chronic change in the immune cells from these animals. So the, and this response was maintained in this experimental, um, st in this study, um, for at least six months. So in summary, um, our, our data with an experimental system um, with, um, showed that early life ozone exposure resulted in a persistent attenuation of an inflammatory response to lipopolysaccharide. Um, and it appears that both the lung and the peripheral blood compartments were affected by this prior exposure. And then last but not least, um, from a biological perspective, this, we thought this was very interesting because it appears that the toll-like receptor 4, which re remember is the receptor for lipopolysaccharide, appears to be affected um, with regards to its ability to elicit an inflammatory response. So next, um, uh, again, uh, with, with this information, with this data, um, and knowing that early life exposures result in a change, in a persistent change in the immune compartment, um, we wanted to next look, evaluate whether a similar type of a response um, could be measured in animals that were exposed to ambient air pollution. And um, I wanted to include these uh, uh, pictures. Um, the, as you can see, the, from the date listed on these pictures, um, these were taken quite some time ago, but I think they, they nicely illustrate the exposure conditions of our animals. So where were these taken? Um, these slides, or these pictures, excuse me, Trying to, trying to be patient. And, okay, there we go. We got the, the arrow back. Oh, um, this road that you see here is Hutchinson Road. And actually, at the very far end, you might see, be able, if you squint, you might be able to see the outline of the administration building for the Primate Center. Um, but I want, what I want you to focus on uh, are, is back here, you can see the hills um, of Vacaville. From the, uh, uh, on a very clear day in, in February. Now, in, in May of that same year, you can see, again, from the exact same spot, that the uh, Vacaville Hills are uh, obscured um, when air quality actually um, uh, uh, is reduced. And, and the point of this slide really is to demonstrate that our animals, which are housed outdoors down this path, down this road, are being exposed to the same type of poor air quality that humans um, um, are exposed to. So coinciding with this overlap in um, uh, air quality decline over the summer period is uh, a dramatic increase in numbers of animals in our outdoor colonies. And as Dr. Drexler mentioned, um, the the, uh, the uh, exposure condition, which um, I'll be discussing in a moment, um, uh, coincided with a period of time where we had a very large number of infant monkeys um, within our outdoor field cages, as I, just sh as I showed you earlier on, within North Colony. Um, so spring, as shown here, is really a very, very 
um, busy time for our staff because the numbers of animals that increase uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, um, are housed in our outdoor colony uh, dr uh, increases dramatically. Um, um, and you can, as you can see here, all of our infants um, are raised uh, when they're, they're born outside and they're raised outside and they're actually nursed for quite some time by um, their mothers um, or dams. Now the, uh, the exposure condition which we uh, really took advantage of and, uh, as an opportunity to study the effects of ambient air pollution in our outdoor animal uh, colony um, is this uh, exposure, uh, is, is this event which Dr. Drexler mentioned. Um, this was a very unique event that took place in 2008, specifically in the month of June in which, uh, which was really an outcome of a, an unusual weather condition which elicited dry lightning and triggered a number of wildfires um, in Northern California. Now, what this graph shows you is the um, PM 2.5, oh, excuse me, I'm very sorry, I'm not a, a PC person, so Bear with me as I try to control the arrows. Here we go. Um, what this graph shows you is the PM 2.5 measures or values from a Air Resources Board site located about a mile from the California Primate Research Center. So here, let's see if I can get this back here. Um, we find uh, we, we what we observe when we were able to document this is uh, a, a, a period. There are actually two events, two two uh, periods in which the PM 2.5 count or readings were uh, extremely high, way above the national standard of 35 micrograms per cubic meter f uh, for a 24-hour period. Um, these values are overlaid with values that we obtained for 2009 within a comparable period. So clearly within, uh, in 2008, the animals that were housed outdoors, specifically the infant monkeys that were housed outdoors, were exposed to a significant amount of PM 2.5. And um, quite frankly, a, one d didn't need the readings from this uh, from this monitoring station to know that the animals were exposed to very high levels. I don't know what the visibility was like in Sacramento. I can tell you from my office, which is located on site at the California Primate Center, it looked like we were in the middle of winter and it looked like fog um, for a number of days. So it was very clear to me that the animals that were being uh, heavily exposed to um, uh, PM 2.5, again, from the wildfires. Now, um, I also wanted to show you the ozone readings um, within this time period. Again, um, there were two days in which uh, ozone, uh, the concentration of ozone, was in fact above the national standard of 0.075 <laughs> parts per million for eight hours, uh, but they were just, uh, this was limited to two days um, as, as compared with PM 2.5. So um, again, the animals were exposed, uh, I, the, the level of exposure was pr primarily, uh, the, the highest level of exposure appeared to be to PM 2.5, but uh, I, I, I should mention that um, ozone levels were also elevated during those uh, uh, periods of, 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 of uh, exposure. And, uh, in, and this is in comparison with uh, the comparable period in 2009. So based upon our knowledge of the previous study that I mentioned, the scientific basis for um, why we, we, want, we wanted to uh, study the immune system and lung function in our young animals based upon our previous knowledge with our experimental model system. Um, we wanted to take advantage of this unique um, exposure condition to study whether a comparable effect could be 
determined or measured in our outdoor housed animals. So we asked two questions. Um, very simply, can, uh, we asked whether we could detect immune effects, persistent immune effects, um, in our outdoor housed animals. Um, and specifically, we targeted animals that were infants during this period of exposure. We also evaluated whether lung function um, was also affected during this period of time. And I should uh, uh, mention here that uh, we specifically focused on animals that were, that were infants during this period of time, but when we evaluated these animals, we evaluated the animals at three years of age. So what does that mean in human terms? A uh, three-year-old monkey is about the equivalent of an adolescent human, so probably about 13 or 14 years of age, so an early teenager. So uh, the slide shows you the study design, um, a very straightforward study design. Um, we uh, started off with a cohort of 50 animals um, that were born in our outdoor colony in the spring of 2008. So we specifically targeted a range of animals from one to three months of age. And we balanced our cohort for males and females. Um, as a control, um, we uh, conducted uh, similar analyses. Oh boy, I'm really struggling here, sorry. Uh, we conducted a similar analysis with animals that were born in our outdoor colony in 2009, the, subs the following year. Again, within the same um, uh, uh, age range. And when we, I have to say, when we evaluated our animals, what we did, we act so that animals would be age matched, we evaluated them in subsequent years. So all of the animals were age matched. And when we actually collected peripheral blood and did our lung function studies, what we tried to do is we, we tried to uh, uh, evaluate them in comparable periods of time. So what that meant is studying female animals in the study um, within the summer to be able uh, with and then studying the male monkeys in the fall. And this is uh, um, actually from a practical standpoint, it's very difficult to um, uh, do all of these studies all at once. Um, each animal uh, is, is done, um, or it, we're really limited to studying one animal at a time, <laughs> quite frankly. So um, uh, 25 animals takes, or t it took us at least three months to actually collect all the measures um, that I'm presenting to, uh, to you today. So we collected uh, peripheral blood from these animals as well as uh, uh, conducted lung function studies. So as I mentioned, we used a comparable type of analysis to study immune function. Um, we, in our peripheral blood samples, we uh, stimulated the, the peripheral blood samples in culture with lipopolysaccharide. And remember, this elicits an, inf an inflammatory response by binding to the toll-like receptor 4. And the cytokines that we measured were interleukin-6 and interleukin-8. Again, these are proteins that are elicited typically in an inflammatory response. In addition to lipopolysaccharide, um, we also evaluated the, uh, the signaling response, the inflammatory response, to a protein called flagellin. So flagellin is actually an important component of motility for bacteria, and this is recognized by another receptor called TLR or toll-like receptor 5. So this is uh, a member of this uh, large family of receptors, as you may recall earlier on, that are associated with innate immune signaling. And in a similar fashion, we, have, we, we measured IL-6, interleukin-6, and interleukin-8 as measures of uh, an inflammatory response. So um, for the remainder of, uh, of this talk, I'm going to actually present to you some of the key findings that, uh, which were discussed in the final report for this study. And I'll try to highlight what I think are, I think, the most exciting uh, findings and uh, where we're going with this. So when we 
collected peripheral blood samples, and again, I, I should really emphasize that this was a non-invasive study. So um, we, all that we did with these animals is we um, brought them indoors, conducted lung function studies, just as, as one um, does as a human, and then we collected blood. And then the blood samples were later taken to a laboratory and then cultured with the with either lipopolysaccharide or flagellin, and then um, the inflammatory response was measured at a later time point. So the, uh, what this graph represents is the outcome of our studies with lipopolysaccharide. Now, overall, um, lipopolysaccharide stimulation of our peripheral blood cells from all the animals in 2008 was significantly attenuated with regards to production of IL-6 and IL-8. So the response was, in fact, attenuated um, across the board when both males and females were combined. When we split them, the animals up into by gender, um, we, I thought we, we uh, got some very interesting uh, findings. Um, what we found, in fact, that um, gender actually matters. Gender, gender really had an impact on how robust the response was in these animals. So here, um, in the production of IL-6, males are actually much more responsive. The, the male monkeys born in 2008 were actually much more um, attenuated as compared with the males born in 2009. Now, again, as I mentioned, the group as a whole um, el uh, elicited an exposure-dependent effect, but again, males were much more, appeared to be much more sensitive. Um, with interleukin-8 production, we don't see that much of a difference, although when we combine both males and females, we do get an exposure-dependent effect. Now, with... Oops. Um, flagellin, remember, which recognizes a different toll receptor, toll-like receptor 5, um, we, we see a, a slightly different um, pattern. Um, with flagellin, we, we were able to detect an exposure-defendant effect in the synthesis of interleukin-8, and females specifically were, appeared to be more sensitive with regards to this attenuated response. So, and this was actually, I th this is actually, uh, I, th I think, um, a, a very significant finding in that it's very clear that these two molecules, again, which are mimics of infectious organisms or infectious microbes, don't respond in exactly the same fashion. Um, it's, it's very clear that both microbes elicit slightly different effects, they, they function through slightly different pathways, and the, the response, the bottom line response, the synthesis of these pro-inflammatory cytokines varies depending upon whether the animal is a male or a female. Oops. There we go. So, um, recently, um, because I was actually very concerned that the effects that we were measuring um, uh, were, I, I was concerned whether or not the effects were limited to the infants. And I wanted to know whether the adults that were in the field cages um, with the infants were also affected in a persistent fashion. So we actually went out and we screened a, about 20 females um, that were in the field cages with our infant monkeys in 2008. And we st uh, collected peripheral blood again and stimulated the peripheral blood with flagellin. And we found that, in fact, the IL-8 response was not inhibited. And if anything, the IL-8, uh, the synthesis of IL-8 was uh, increased. I can't tell you if this is an exposure-dependent effect, um, but we do know that with age, the production of IL-8 actually increases. So I think the, the large amount of IL-8 that we see here is actually an age-dependent, a normal age-dependent increase. Um, but in a nutshell, what this means is that the adults did not exhibit an attenuated immune response 
um, as compared with the infants that were also in the same cages. To get at a mechanism for this response, it's very clear that these immune cells in these animals have an intrinsic defect with regards to their ability to respond to an infectious agent. So we pursued um, tried a, a series of studies to try to get at some of the molecular mechanisms involved in this process. And in a very limited number of samples, um, we evaluated um, uh, peripheral blood samples from uh, female, exclusively from female animals born in 2008 relative to females born in 2009. And what we found, if I can control this arrow here, um, using a, an array method which, which honed in on genes associated with the toll-like receptor pathway. And I realize this is a very complicated slide and I don't expect you to um, follow all of the different molecules involved in this process. Um, but the bottom line is that there were a number of different uh, factors, specifically transcriptional factors, which bind to DNA um, within the nucleus of the cell and regulate inflammatory responses. So there are two transcriptional factors which actually were increased in the female uh, monkeys born in 2008. With lipopolysaccharide stimulation, these animals expressed more MIDE88, which is a protein that's associated uh, with the toll-like receptor 4 uh, uh, pathway. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, and then with flagellin, we also observed a significant increase in I kappa kappa alpha, which is a key signaling molecule in this process. So again, studies are uh, continuing and ongoing, but uh, we're really trying to, well, it's very clear to us that there is an intrinsic molecular defect in the immune cells from animals that were exposed to the uh, wildfire smoke. Now, what happened with lung function? Um, lung function was actually very interesting in that, as always, uh, the unexpected is, is, the, is, is the most interesting. Now, when we evaluated animals as a whole for airways hyperresponsiveness, so airways hyperresponsiveness here is a measure of the sensitivity of animals to histamine. Oh, gosh. Sorry. I. Um, so a lower value actually indicates higher re airways reactivity. And what we found is that the 2008 males um, were actually less reactive as compared to the 2009 counterparts, and there was no effect in the females. Um, lung compliance was uh, interesting in that the 2008 animals the 2008 males, excuse me, appeared to be more compliant as compared to the 2009 males. So lung function as a whole didn't really tell us a whole lot, uh, 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 wasn't that informative with regards to exposure. Um, but when we actually combined our uh, analysis of lung function with immune responsiveness, we got some very interesting um, uh, results. So when we correlated airways reactivity with the production of cytokines to either in response to lipopolysaccharide or flagellin, what we found exclusively in the female animals is a significant correlation with, uh, of, IL, of IL-8 with uh, airways reactivity. So I'm going to attempt to move this here. Here we go. Excuse me. Here we go. So these are the dat data for the females born in 2008. These are the data for females born in 2009. So what this means is that the animals that produced the least amount of IL-8. So these were the animals that were most affected with exposure with an attenuated response 
actually were the most reactive. So they were the most sensitive to histamine. In comparison, the females from 2009 had no correlation, and the males were very similar in, res in, in response. Now with females, with uh, uh, compliance measures, we also obtained some very interesting results. So uh, animals that were least compliant, or, or with, with a reduction in compliance, we also found a reduction in the production of IL-6. So the, the animals that had the least amount of IL-6 production were the least compliant. So what does that mean? That means that the animals that exhibited the most attenuated response with regards to IL-6 had a more stiff lung, less compliant lung. And again, no effect, uh, no correlation with uh, uh, of, this, of, of both of these parameters in females born in 2009, and no effect whatsoever in, in males. So in summary, um, some of the key findings that were presented here um, from this uh, Air Resources Board funded study um, indicate that the animals housed outdoors at the California Primate Research Centers that were exposed to the wildfire smoke at infancy um, exhibited globally a persistent downregulation of responsiveness to lipopolysaccharide stimulation as well as flagellin stimulation. Um, so what this means is that their ability to elicit an inflammatory response to an infectious agent was significantly dampened as compared to their uh, counterparts that did not receive this type of exposure. The other interesting thing that came out of this study is that it's very clear that there were gender-dependent effects. And, there, uh, and the gender-dependent effects depended upon what parameter we, we measured, whether we, we stimulated peripheral blood cells with lipopolysaccharide or flagellin, or whether or not we uh, are, are, are or, or, or they were variable with regards to the lung fu function parameter that were measured. And then finally, uh, what's very exciting to us is that we were able to detect um, what appears to be a persistent change in the actual molecular programming of the immune cells in these animals. So um, in conclusion, this is my very, very uh, simplified way of trying to explain a very complex process. So in, under normal circumstances, development takes place in a very synchronized fashion. And develop, normal development requires a series of on and off switches that go off in a highly orchestrated fashion. And it's quite clear that the mechanisms for normal development require a series of events that take place within the DNA of each cell in an animal. In environment, we, th we, we speculate that environment, the role of environment, is to actually perturb or modulate this very uh, 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 highly orchestrated uh, pathway, molecular pathway, and we think that environment actually serves as as I've illustrated here, a dimmer switch. So the tweaks that environment um, uh, contribute are very, very small, but powerful. And it's very clear that these tweaks, these molecular changes, can be maintained in an individual's DNA for an extended period of time. So ultimately, the combination of these two uh, events, um, con may, we think, um, may contribute to lifelong or chronic development of disease. And lastly, um, I want to acknowledge a number of individuals th that have participated in these studies, both in the experimental study that, I've, uh, uh, that I discussed earlier on, as well as uh, this Air Resources Board study. Um, first of all, uh, 
Candy Clay from my lab, who's a postdoctoral fellow, um, worked on the Air Resources Board study, as well as Ed Schlegel, who uh, conducted all the pulmonary function measures. Um, some data that I didn't mention, but is in the report, uh, was actually contributed by John Capitanio. John Capitanio is, uh, is an expert in in rhesus macaque behavior, and he actually showed in a subset of our animals that uh, some of these animals that were in that were exposed to wildfire smoke actually had or uh, exhibited a form of what he calls an inhibited temperament. Um, and we, and it, and, and again, this is a very small subset of animals. It appears that these animals also exhibited an attenuated immune response. So we're hoping to follow up uh, with, those, uh, with those data. Um, additional individuals um, uh, participated in some of uh, the other studies that I mentioned. Um, the uh, NIH-supported study was led by Ed Polstowait from the University of Alabama, as well as Jack Harkema from Michigan State. And I've listed also the funding sources um, for all the studies. And I also <laughs> want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Drexler, for the, who's a project manager for, the, for this pro uh, study, uh, for all of the feedback that I've, I've received. And um, last but not least, um, I wanted to mention um, the Respiratory Diseases Center, which is opening at the California Primate Center. Um, this is actually a typo. I apologize for this. It's actually opening on February 27th. Uh, of 2014, so next month we're, we're hosting a grand opening. Why is this really exciting for, uh, uh, for us? Um, this is an NIH-funded uh, new building, um, which uh, NIH provided us the funds for a state-of-the-art inhalation exposure facility as well as new laboratory space. So we're going to have a grand opening ceremony. Um, if anybody's interested in attending, I'd be delighted to send you an invitation. We'd love to have uh, for folks from the Air Resources Board uh, coming out for a visit. Um, we'll be having a presentation and we'll be having tours, which always gets people excited. And last but not least, questions. And thank you very much for your attention. It, 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 yeah. <coughs> Where's the microphone? Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, we have received our first question here from Ian Gilmore at EPA in RTP. And he asks, were the differences in cytokine production associated with changes in peripheral blood cell subpopulations, or was it actually an altered ability of the same cell type to make the mediators? That's a really good question. Um, we, for the wildfire smoke exposed animals, we've not carefully analyzed the different immune cell populations um, from a, a gross standpoint. So for this is from an immunologist standpoint, um, which is probably what uh, Ian is, is driving at. We don't see significant differences in numbers of monocytes or lymphocytes, but we've not done extensive analysis by flow cytometry um, so that I can tell you whether or not there are more of a specific um, subtype um, in these animals. Hopefully that answers his question. Hi, thank you very much. A great talk. Um, I, I wanted a little more information on their actual exposure. You showed some monitoring data. Uh, where was the monitor relative to where the monkeys were, and is there a more exact picture of exactly how much they were exposed to? Good question. Um, I, the actual monitor, I believe, is located about a mile from the primate center. Um, but beyond that, I, I, I can't provide you with any more information in terms of the actual amount that each animal received. It'd be nice if they, we could get them personal monitors. <laughs> relatively small area. 
Right. So all of the all of the animals that were sampled were within the North Colony that I showed you on the slide. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller, for a really interesting presentation. And uh, we look forward to hearing about what else comes out of your work in the future. Thank you. Um, thank you all for attending. <clears throat> Sorry, I had a hard time with the... Uh don't worry. <laughs> Every, everyone suffers through okay. that. Let me just take okay. that off here. Uh, we're also interested, that is our public information office, is... Uh